Well, I'm, I'm very excited for today's sermon. I, I invited Reverend Brady, who's a senior pastor at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge. He's uh, uh, the senior pastor of our main campus. Brady is uh, not just a friend, not just a, a, a boss. He's a mentor in my life and has spoken into my life so many times. And I'm, I'm excited for you to get to hear from him. Uh, he'll be preaching on transfiguration. And if you don't know what that is, uh, he, he'll explain that in his sermon. But I've already heard his sermon. It, it really challenged me, and I hope it'll be a challenge to you. So join me in welcoming Reverend Brady Witten. Hey, everyone. Uh, I want to say thanks to Fernie for the invitation to preach here at Mid-City Church. And I uh, look forward to being able to share with you all today. So the scripture reading uh, that I want to share comes from the Gospel of Mark. And uh, it starts with the second chapter. And this is the story of Jesus' transfiguration, kind of a mysterious story. So hear this. So six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up to a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I often hear from people uh, pretty regularly uh, who want to deepen their, their faith walk. They want to you know, deepen their relationship with Jesus, but they're not quite sure how or they feel kind of stuck or they don't know which way to go. Um, does that describe you? You ever feel that way? Uh, if so, I want to invite you to play, uh, pay particular attention to this sermon, this story from the Transfiguration, because I think we can learn from some tips about how we can deepen and maybe kind of jumpstart our relationship with Jesus. So uh, the story of the, of the transfiguration occurs in all three Gospels. So we read about it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's also mentioned in uh, the second, uh, Peter's second letter, so Second Peter. Uh, and I would encourage you, if you're interested in, in that, look, look it up. Um, but what happens is Jesus takes three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, up to a high mountain, uh, some say it was Mount Tabor, others say it was Mount Hermon, but the scripture doesn't tell us which one. Uh, whichever mountain it was, Jesus takes them there, and while they're up on the top of this mountain, he is transfigured. Now, this is sort of a strange word, right? It's not one we use very often. We don't hear it very often. Uh, transfigured is to be transformed, metamorphosized, transmuted, transmogrified. These are all synonyms for the word. Uh, it means to change from one thing into another thing. And it actually, it often means something uh, more beautiful or something more elevated, right? So that's this idea of something being transfigured. Mark says that in this moment, Jesus' clothes were transformed and became a dazzling white color such that no bleach on earth could make it. I find that, that that's an interesting detail, right? So they were so white, he's saying, it's like nothing on earth. It was an otherworldly kind of glow, right? That's the picture that Mark is painting here. Um, as, if this, as if this kind of glowing wasn't unsettling enough, Mark goes on to tell us that suddenly Elijah and Moses were both there present with Jesus, and they're having a conversation. And I got to say, part of me wants to know, what were they talking about? <laughs> like, what was that conversation? We don't know. There's no, there's no clue there. So then uh, after this happens, Peter says something silly to Jesus. He says, hey, let me make you three tents, or let me make you three dwellings here, one for you, uh, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And I say that it was a silly thing to say because Mark goes on right after that and tells us that Peter didn't know what to say because they were terrified, right? This is this overwhelming moment. Peter's not quite sure what to say. You ever had one of those moments where you just kind of you just say something? And I think that's what's happening to, to Peter here. Um, then a cloud overshadows them, Mark says. Uh, and they hear a voice from that cloud. And the voice says, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. And then just as fast as it all happened, uh, Mark actually uses the word suddenly. Suddenly, uh, Elijah's gone, Moses is gone, the cloud is gone, and they're just left there with Jesus. And that's, that's the story of the transfiguration. 
so what's going on here? This is kind of a mysterious story. Uh, what is this incident telling us and what are we to learn from it? And so this is the first tip I want to offer. If you're, if you're uh, looking to deepen your relationship with God, deepen your relationship with Jesus, and that's this. Become a student of the scriptures. Uh, and I say that because this transfiguration story is one of those stories uh, that the better we know the Bible and the better we know the stories of the Bible, the more this story speaks to us, right? And so one of the ways that uh, your relationship with God can come alive is to make help the scriptures come alive. And one of the ways the scriptures can come alive for you is by studying them and learning more about them. So uh, I know that everybody doesn't like to read and study. We're not all students. Uh, I've got a son at home who you know, just doesn't seem to like school very much. He's probably not going to grow up and become a great Bible scholar. Who knows? But, uh, but there are a lot of ways you can learn, right? You can uh, listen to audio books. Uh, you can listen to podcasts. Uh, immerse yourself in the world of Scripture, however you need to do that, and the Scriptures will speak to you. And I just want to offer two quick books that I've found really helpful. One is a book called Making Sense of the Bible by Adam Hamilton. Uh, it just kind of helps you think through the Bible, maybe get to know it a little bit better. And the other one is a book called Epic of Eden by uh, Dr. Sandy Richter. And it's a great book about the Old Testament and helped, helped make sense out of the Old Testament for me and I know for a lot of people. So, with a little familiarity about the Bible, with a little bit of familiarity about the Old Testament stories, we can see that it's no accident that Moses and Elijah are uh, appear or with this uh, sorry on the mountain with Jesus. It's no accident. See, Moses was a prophet, and Moses also had these mountain encounters with God. Probably one of the most famous mountain encounters Moses had was the story of the burning bush, right? He's on, he's on a mountain and suddenly there's this bush on fire and God speaks to him. But later on, Moses has uh, multiple other encounters with God where he goes to the top of a mountain called Mount Sinai. And while he's at the top of this mountain, very much like the transfiguration story, this cloud descends upon the mountain and we're told that God was in that cloud. Uh, another thing we see in Moses is when he encounters God, his face glows this radiant glowing white to the point where he has to put a veil over his face, right? So we see this kind of glowing, otherworldly white thing going on. And when you know the Moses story and you're reading the Transfiguration story, you begin to see, oh, there's, there's these connecting pieces going on here. Uh, Elijah also had an encounter with God. You want to guess where? On the top of a mountain. God says, go to the top of this mountain and I'm going to appear before you. And this is a really famous story from the book of 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, where uh, God comes uh, by, Elijah kind of passes by, and we, we hear that God is not in the fire, he's not in an earthquake, he's not in this mighty wind, but God speaks to Elijah in this still, small voice, right? So again, when we know these Old Testament stories and we're familiar with them, uh, we can start to get a sense of what ha what's happening in the Transfiguration. So what is going on in the story of the Transfiguration? This is yet another biblical mountaintop encounter with God, right? It's known as a theophany, an appearing of God. So in this transfiguration story in Mark 9, we have God appearing, much like he did in the, in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament. So we could ask a whole lot of questions about this appearance. Uh, one of the ones that I want us to ask, though, is why now? Why is God appearing now in this, in this story of Jesus and his life in this gospel? So up until this point, uh, the disciples are really struggling to understand who Jesus is. Now, they, have a, they of course know that Jesus is somebody special. He's somebody that they want to follow. Uh, they even have this idea that he's the Jewish Messiah, but they, they weren't really sure what that meant. But they didn't have a full picture of what God was really up to. And they really resisted this idea that Jesus started sharing with them that he was going to be uh, turned over to the authorities, crucified, that he was going to die, and that on the third day he was going to uh, be raised from the dead. And when he started sharing that with them, they really started struggling. So if we go just one chapter before uh, Mark 9, uh, we see this interaction happens with uh, Jesus. Um, so uh, trying to find this here. So Jesus began to teach the disciples. This is uh, Mark 8, verse 31. It says, Jesus began to teach the disciples that he must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke to them quite openly about this. But Peter took Jesus aside, and note this word here, it says, he rebuked him. 
This is the, the disciple rebuking the teacher, right? Uh, but I love this. But turning and looking at the disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. So you see, just before the transfiguration, we see the disciples struggling to understand who Jesus is and what God is doing in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, and I love this idea that, you know, kind of, kind of what Jesus does is he says to Peter, and he says to James and John, he goes, come with me. Come on. I want you all to come with me for a minute. I want you to see something. Um, and that's when Jesus takes them up on the top of this mountain, and God appears, right? So why does God make this appearance now? Why is it happening right now? I think it's because the disciples needed a little bit of a spiritual boost, right? The disciples needed to, to in this moment, to understand more fully who Jesus was. Uh, and maybe they also needed a little kick in the pants, a little spiritual kick in the pants. Uh, again, how about you? Are, you? are you in a place where you're saying, you know what, I need, I need to... Uh, you know, I, need, I want a little boost in my spiritual life. I want to deepen my, my relationship with God and my relationship with Jesus. Uh, God's message in the transformation, in the transfiguration, offers us some clues about what we might do. So again, first one I want to suggest, learn the scriptures, right? Become a student of the scriptures. But there's two more things. Here's the next one. One of the things that God says in this message from the clouds is, this is my son, the beloved. And so he reminds us of who Jesus is. And this is a really important question, and it's one that we're faced with kind of right in the middle of the Gospel of Mark, right around this time. Jesus asked the question of Peter, who do you say that I am? And I think at the same time, we're meant to wrestle with this question. Who do we say that Jesus is? Who do you say that Jesus is? Who is Jesus to you? And there are all kinds of ways we can answer this question. You know, we can talk about Jesus as being a, a, good, a, a good moral teacher, a good example. Uh, some people think, well, he was a great rabbi. He was the, he's the founder of a world religion. Uh, but what the Christian tradition tells us, and really in some ways what this transfiguration story claims for us, is that Jesus is divine. Jesus is the Son of God, uh, one of the three persons of the Trinity in, in the Christian understanding. So there's a, there's a way of thinking about Jesus that's known as the trilemma. And it's just helpful every once in a while to kind of visit these ideas. Um, and, the, and the trilemma says this. So Jesus throughout the New Testament claims to have this special relationship with God. And uh, when you get to the Gospel of John in some places, he says it outright. He says, I and the Father are one. Jesus claims to be God. And so you either got one of three things that are possible. Either Jesus was crazy, right? He could be, you know, just a crazy person, <laughs> or Jesus was intentionally deceiving people, or Jesus is who he, who he says he was. And so when you think about this question of who is Jesus to you, um, I think the scriptures really only leave us with these options. Do you think that Jesus was out of his mind? Do you think Jesus was deceiving people? Or is Jesus divine? Uh, and if your answer is, no, I believe that Jesus is divine, then that sets up this whole other uh, way of relating to Jesus. If, if Jesus is God, then our life with Jesus, our following Jesus, uh, our listening to the things that Jesus teaches and that Jesus claims uh, become much, much more serious, right? So I would just ask you, who do you say that Jesus is, right? Get, get clear about that. And then the second tip uh, is really the third thing, but the second one from God's message is this. He says, listen to him. Listen to Jesus. So it only makes sense that if Jesus is God, if Jesus is divine, that when Jesus tells me something or Jesus gives me some instruction, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to what Jesus says, right? And I guess what I want to ask is, do you? Do you listen to what Jesus says? Uh, years ago, I heard a question that was, has been helpful to me in my journey as a disciple, and it's this. Can you name one thing that you do in your life because Jesus told you to? You know, it's not something you want to do that you happen to agree with Jesus. <laughs> it's something that you do specifically because Jesus told you to do it. Now, what, what might some of those things be? You know, it could be uh, prayer. You know, Jesus commands us in Matthew. He says, uh, when you pray, when you fast, when you give, do you, do you have those practices in your life? Uh, maybe it's going and visiting the sick or caring for the poor. Jesus commands us to do those things. Uh, probably one of the biggest commands Jesus gives us is to love one another. How about praying for your enemies? 
How about forgiving people who persecute me? There's all these things that Jesus told us to do. Can you name one thing you do because Jesus told you to? So I was trying to think of some examples of this from the life of our church, and, uh, and, I, and I thought of this one. So one of the biggest challenges we faced as a church during the pandemic is caring for the sick and the elderly. You know, the hospitals weren't allowing visitation for a time. It wasn't safe to go to people's homes, et cetera. So we were able to make phone calls. We were able to send text messages and do those kinds of things. Uh, but uh, one thing that really suffered was we usually have a very great ministry to retirement communities and to people that are living in, uh, you know, in, in some ways lonely situations, sometimes isolated from their families. And we were unable to do many of those ministries. But I, I'm really uh, proud of our congregational care ministry because they didn't, they didn't give up, right? And so they kept trying to think of ways that they could, they could continue to minister to these folks. And so they organized open air visits to places in Baton Rouge like Williamsburg, Amber Terrace, and the Blake. Uh, the ELC children made signs that we took and we held up outside those retirement communities, just letting those people know that we loved them and cared about them and that God loved them and cared about them. Uh, Kelly Tony, uh, Reverend Greg Tony's wife, played the violin. Uh, we read scripture, we said prayers, we gave messages. Uh, but do you know why we did those things? Why do we as a church go out and care for the elderly and care for the sick and visit the lonely? Because Jesus commanded us to. Uh, you know, Jesus says in, in the Gospel of John, he says, a new command I give you, love one another, another as I have loved you. And so that's why, that's why we do these things. Uh, but I can tell you this, by, by following that command of Jesus, by doing the thing that Jesus told us to do, the people who participated in those, in those uh, outdoor visits and the people who received those outdoor visits experienced the presence of God in a, in a palpable way. I can tell you, when I was there, my heart, my spirits were just lifted being able to bring the love of God uh, to people who found themselves kind of in difficult and, and lonely situations. One person wrote to us to say uh, thank you, and they wrote this. Thank you, First Methodist, for bringing a service this morning to the Blake Retirement Home. I just talked to my father, who's a resident there, and you can't imagine how much your service lifted his spirits. He hasn't sounded this good in ages. Many, many thanks for the readings, the message, and the music that you brought to these lovely people who have been so confined, right? This is the kind of thing that can happen when we do what Jesus tells us to do. Uh, first of all, we're blessed by it. Others are blessed by it. Uh, and we also discover another thing, that Jesus is trustworthy, that we can trust Jesus. You know, when we do one thing that Jesus says and we go, hey, that was, that was pretty good. Well, guess what? Then maybe we'll do a second thing that Jesus says and a, and a third thing that Jesus says. So again, I just want to ask you the question, is there one thing that you do uh, because Jesus told you to do it. And if you're struggling to think of it, I want to give you a challenge. So uh, next Sunday, we begin Lent. So this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and we're going to have some Ash Wednesday services. And I, I know uh, Mid City's doing a service, and I know you all will be blessed by that. But the next week, and a lot of times Christians take on different practices. So here's what I want to offer you, one idea. Read the Gospel of Mark. Uh, it's a short one. It's the shortest gospel. Read it. And while you're reading, uh, write down some of the things that Jesus tells us to do. And just pick one, right? And go, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do that thing that Jesus told us to do. So do you want to deepen your walk with Jesus? Uh, do you want to do you want to kind of like take your, your uh, relationship with God kind of to the next step? Do you, do you need a little kick in the pants? And again, I just think there are three tips from this uh, transfiguration story that will help you to do that. First of all, you know, become a student of the Bible. The Bible can speak to us in such amazing ways. But in order for it to do that, we really kind of need to learn, le learn the ropes a little bit and, and familiarize yourself with the story of the Bible. And, uh, and, and it'll begin to speak to you in even more powerful ways. The second thing is get clear about, you know, who is Jesus to you? Uh, is Jesus it's just some guy that you're kind of interested in, uh, and maybe, maybe you think he's, he's a nice guy, you like him, you're fond of him, or do you believe that Jesus is divine, and in that sense that he has uh, some important, uh, vital part to play in your life? Uh, and third, do you listen to what Jesus says? I think that these are all things the transfiguration story brings us. Uh, that can help us to deepen our faith in Christ. So that's my hope for you. 
go forth, follow Jesus, uh, and may, may God bless you in all that you do.